Congress. And the question is whether Congress had the authority to enact this law. Uh, the Fourth Circuit struck down the statute, uh, interestingly by a decision by Judge Motz of the Fourth Circuit, who's considered uh, one of the liberal judges on the, on the Fourth Circuit. Uh, and, and the case for, for why that exceeded the Commerce Clause power was basically, hey, civil commitment is a traditional state issue. Uh, there's no clear federal interest here. Uh, this is not. This is an individual law, basically saying the federal government can detain people uh, when there's no federal crime that was committed, or when the, the federal crime uh, has led to punishment, and that punishment has reached its end. Uh, on the other hand, the government says this is really kind of an adjunct to the broader power we have. The federal interest is that these are individuals who have been convicted of a federal crime, uh, and this is part of. The, the sentence, uh, part of what goes along with the broader, uh, uh, broader punishment. Uh, and and it, I think the uh, 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 Comstock case raises a lot of issues beyond the Commerce Clause. If I had to guess, I would say the Supreme Court will say, this is okay by the Commerce Clause because it's a part of this broader federal scheme, uh, uh, part of the broader federal uh, criminal law. But that doesn't mean there aren't some other problems. There are a lot of uh, difficult and controversial questions raised by this civil commitment idea, ex post facto issues, all sorts of possible, uh, possible theories that were raised in the litigation in the Comstock case, uh, but not reached because the court uh, resolved the issue on the Commerce Clause grounds. So that's one where it's kind of hard to say who's the swing vote, uh, because you know, I think this, this happens when Congress passes a law it's kind of a, uh, if you want to put an ideological label on it, sort of a, a law conservatives often like, uh, and yet it's, it's questionable under the Commerce Clause. Well, you sort of wonder, what do the justices do to the extent that justices are, are pushed and pulled by their ideological commitments? Uh, you know, if you're one of the liberal justices, are you, are you more worried about making sure that there's more federal power, or are you worried about the idea of the civil commitment law you might not like, and then you can switch the politics for the other, uh, the other side. Uh, so it's really unclear how the individual justices will come out. Uh, I actually, I, I would predict that it will be a, a reversal 8-1, uh, eight, eight maybe 9-0. Oh. I think actually the, the rejection of this law on Commerce Clause grounds was, was a real reach by the Fourth Circuit. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that's the end of that. We, we may see more challenges to, to the statute. So, so those are a, a couple cases of this term. I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Oren. Uh, as Oren mentioned, that uh, Melendez-Diaz did contain a, a particularly fiery uh, dissent from Justice Kennedy, which was a surprise to those of us who cover the court because we thought he only wrote majority opinions. Um, uh, we're <laughs> we're uh, next going to hear from uh, another Kennedy clerk, uh, Professor Nick Rosencrantz of Georgetown, and uh, I'm having trouble figuring out the theme uh, in the cases he's going to cover uh, for us, but uh, we'll just say they're all are very interesting. Thank you. Uh, my cases do have a theme. They are uh, some of the big constitutional cases of the term, and uh, it's a huge relief to me, and it should be a huge relief to you, that uh, Walter Dellinger has now arrived. So if I say anything wrong, you will have a misimpression in your head for all of 12 minutes, and then he will <laughs> correct me. So that uh, takes the pressure off me a bit. Um, the first <laughs> the um, first case I'm going to talk about is called Free Enterprise Fund versus Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, PCAOB. And uh, this, this is a case you may not have focused on. So I want to try and persuade you this is a big and important case, even if it doesn't appear so at first glance. Um, it helps to call it peekaboo. Yeah, you can call it peekaboo if you want. A lot of people like to do that. The, um, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 creates this entity called the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, PCAOB. Um, to oversee the audit of public companies that are subject to the securities laws. Um, the corporate folks in the room can tell you about what an extraordinarily important function this is, but the issue in the case concerns the extraordinary independence of this board. So we often talk about uh, independence and independence agencies and kind of abstract 
uh, separation of powers terms, but these ideas are really grounded in constitutional text. So Article 2 says the executive power shall be vested in a president, and uh, the president can't really execute all the laws personally, so he delegates some of the law execution to various officers. It remains, though, his personal obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And so he's got to be able to control those officers. Uh, he can give them direct orders, but what if they disobey? Uh, his ultimate control depends on his power to remove them, right? to fire them at the end if they disobey him. So the removal power is a hugely important power for the president in controlling the executive branch. Now, the court has held that Congress can place some restrictions on the president's power to remove certain sorts of officers, like the heads of independent agencies. Um, the SEC, for example, is such an agency, and the president can only remove SEC commissioners for inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office. Now, I imagine many of you uh, might uh, have constitutional doubts about this sort of thing, I'm sad to tell you that this is water under the bridge. However, uh, the PCAOB goes a giant step further. Uh, the PCAOB can be removed only by the SEC and only upon a finding of the commission that the member willfully violated the act or abused authority or failed to enforce compliance with a rule or standard without reasonable justification. So in other words, the PCAOB members are two levels of four-cause removal away from the president. Right? The president can only remove the SEC commissioners for cause, and the SEC commissioners can, in turn, only remove the PCAOB members for cause. So these folks are doubly insulated from presidential control, and as far as anybody can tell, this is the first such arrangement. So nobody can find a precedent for this quite. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and predict, I don't think the court is going to tolerate this novel arrangement. So I think you may see a strong opinion, possibly uh, intimating that Morrison v. Olson should be overturned or something, but um, probably not. Probably you'll see um, a, a fifth vote uh, from Justice Kennedy with a concurrence that says this is not okay for um, – special reasons we will have, will be treated to some rhetoric about the importance of separation of powers, but I don't think we'll necessarily get a real clear holding on what removal law is. However, I do think this case is going to come out the, wrong, the correct way. I think the court is not going to uh, tolerate this novel arrangement uh, for what it's worth. Um, so second, Walton v. Stop the Beach. This is a case that maybe you all are excited about. Um, I think maybe you are more excited than you should be about this one. So um, this is a complicated case concerning property rights. Beachfront property owners have what are called literal rights, property rights specific to the seashore. In Florida, these rights have arguably included rights to future accretions. That's the, the shore grows gradually if the, if the, um, if the ocean recedes a bit. Um, and the right to exclusive access over the upland, proper, uh, upland portion of their property to the water. Uh, I'm sure there are people in this room who know much more about this than I. Um, Florida enacted something called the Beach and Shore Preservation Act, and it was um, intended to combat beach erosion. So there's always beach erosion in Florida. The act requires the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to, um, to uh, try to um, – uh, try to uh, preserve or restore beaches that have been, that have been eroding. Um, and in doing that, the department changes the property boundaries for people who are on the edge from what was, what was the boundary, which is the mean high water line, to the new line that they draw called the erosion control line. And this effectively eliminates, uh, arguably, some common law rights to accretion and to contact with the water. At least that's what is contended for in the case. The Florida Supreme Court said that that's, and so is that a take? Is that a take? Changing the um, legal rights of those property owners, taking away some of their property rights.